switch over and uh, get some of our guests involved in the, this discussion, take a closer look at what's going on in Morocco. I'd like to turn to Beirut first of all. Welcome political analyst, Mr. Maher Saloum. Thank you so much uh, for being with us, sir. Now, let's look at the situation in Morocco. What we're seeing now in Morocco, do you think it is the beginning of uh, what we are seeing in the region, or is there something different to what is taking place in Morocco? Well, if you compare it to uh, Libya, no, it, it's a bit different, maybe closer to Tunisia, in case something happens, another uprising or any opposition coming up, aggravating, you know, inside Morocco. But the situation, if you look at, uh, at it deeply enough, uh, reforms were needed by the people. Uh, young uh, people, they need uh, for sure opportunities for employment. They want to fight corruption in the system. I mean the departments, the ministries inside Morocco. And we have witnessed, if you remember with me, about a month or so ago, the king himself, uh, Mohammed VI, he has uh, delivered a certain important speech towards his own people actually inside Morocco. Uh, until now, I cannot analyze if the situation is comparable to any nation, but I can see it, it could be uh, towards another uprising in another state in the Arabian nations. Okay, well, let me turn to London and get broadcaster and specialists on African affairs in on this, uh, Ayo Johnson. Mr. Ayo Johnson, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, what's your take on what's going on in Morocco? Uh, do you think that this is going to turn into a full uh, force uprising? Or is it uh, just some people that are discontent at the status quo, but with the changes that the king have made and uh, is in the process, uh, it is said, of trying to make, that that will be enough? Well, um, thank you for having me on Press TV. Um, absolutely. I think this is a, it's in keeping with what we've seen in Tunisia, Egypt, um, and of course in Libya, is that uh, the people are not scared anymore. They have now awoken, they realize that the wind of change happening across Africa, especially North Africa, into the, the Middle East. And um, they want what you and I and many people around the world aspire for, which is they want better jobs, they want more freedom, um, they want to have a say in how their lives are governed, and uh, they do not want to be suppressed. And uh, what we see in Morocco is that the king, especially King Mohammed, who's been there for a while, um, he hasn't delivered for his people. A lot of the reforms that have been promised have not come to materialize, and his prime minister, um, uh, Mr. Abbas El Fassi, has not really um, uh, delivered on his behalf. So uh, uh, the people of Morocco are saying no more. So which is why we've had a series of protests, large num numbers of people coming to the streets each time. The numbers are increasing. The expectation is ex increasing. And uh, the, the, the government as a whole, and especially that of King Mohammed, are very concerned, which is why they're trying to change the legislation to accommodate the protesters, but each time they do so, it's not enough. People are asking for that much more. So uh, they have a long way to go, and they are concerned that what they've seen in uh, Tunisia and Egypt could truly happen in Morocco. Okay, now, Mr. Saloum, what is it about? It, it seems that in all these countries that these uprisings are taking place in revolutions, that there are certain things that they all seem to have in common. One is the extreme, uh, extreme corruption uh, in these countries. And uh, for many of them, the lack of job opportunity that exists in their country. And interesting enough, so many of these countries are really not poor countries, but there seems to be a lack of uh, distribution of wealth. Um, let's look at this. Why do you think that this is the case? Hello, are you asking Mr. me? Or Saloum? The guest Mr. Saloum, can you hear me? Yes, you were delivering the question to me? Yes, sir. Uh, b because there has been uh, no accountability so far by the, I mean, the responsible people inside the government in Morocco or any government in the Arabian world so far. What we need is accountability measures. People have to be monitored, whether they are director generals or ministry, uh, you know, in, in hold of a ministership or in, in a uh, position where he is a consultant or she is a consultant to a prime minister and even prime ministers and even presidents, they have to be monitored. People are not monitoring. They are not holding accountable their own uh, leaders, their own officials. In this matter, we need to be more aware of what's going on inside our nations in Arabia. Now, this is a purely, uh, this is a step ahead to be more aware 
And we need to have ind or indulge ourselves into activities such as awareness programs inside our societies. So we need a rootly change. We need to look for a change, not a minimal, but a root change in our own systems to look ahead and, you know, uh, do certain major reforms in order for us to be, uh, to, to be advancing ahead and to have a certain democracy, not to be imitated by the West or not imitating the West, but because we have our own independent democratic values and governance inside the Arab world. This is the true meaning and, uh, and the true, uh, true method of a true democracy inside the Arab world today well, that I look for. Well, let me look at the, look, take a closer look at what you just said, Mr. Saloum. Do you think that there is some difficulty in actually finding their way in the Arab world? Um, as you just talked about certain systems from the West and they look at certain systems from the East, one trying to implement and maintain their own culture, but at the si same time trying to libera liberalize certain aspects uh, um, of the uh, society. I is it a dilemma uh, at all, do you see? Could be a dilemma, but this is a question to be raised and to be discussed, you know, on a high level, I think, between Arab nations, maybe through the Arab League, maybe through their own independent organizations that, can, that they can help uh, or hold accountable their own uh, leaders and officials in each country. But we need to look ahead and think a bit uh, more wisely enough in order for us to achieve a certain independent and sovereignty uh, state in the, in the Arab world today. Now, there are no people that are held accountable, uh, unfortunately, so far, even in Lebanon that we are uh, being witnessing right now, the Lebanon that have been uh, even uh, envied by the, his Arab neighbors and the Arab world so far. And uh, Lebanon has not achieved until now an, an, uh, an independent, a sovereign state because there are a lot of uh, regional and international intervention of its own system, and pressure have been aggravating since 1943 until now. I'm giving you just a small example of my own nation that I was born here right. in Lebanon, where I'm talking to. Okay. All right, let me turn to Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, 1999 was when uh, King Mohammed VI took over, uh, and uh, at that time he promised a lot of changes in the country, um, but uh, they did not, critics are saying that they did not take place, or very few take, took place, and recently now he has uh, made some comments, made a speech, and said that there are changes on the horizon. Do you think that he will be able to hang on to power if he can make the changes at this point in time? Or do you see in Morocco a level of frustration um, that ultimately perhaps will lead to a total change in the regime in Morocco? Well, the, that's an excellent question. The problem you've got in Morocco is that the king is way, way too powerful. The king can dissolve parliament, the king can appoint a dismissive prime minister, and the king is constantly involved in the political and the business sectors of, of Morocco. So uh, he's, he's, he's seen as an interference into the, the general workings of an economy for which, as a king, he should really take a back seat. Um, uh, in saying how long he's been in power, no doubt about it, when he came into power, there was a little, lot of corruption, and there still is, and there was a lot of violation of human rights, which was back then through his father, and, and, and he's tried to change the status quo. But uh, the reforms have not happened very quickly simply because the uh, Moroccans are very, very highly educated, especially the youthful population that they do have, similar to what we see in Egypt and in Tunisia. Educated, youthful, uh, want so much more, aware of how the world really truly operates, willing to use the social networking sites, Twitter, Facebook, and so on and so forth, as a means of galvanizing their campaigns. Um, they, they, they are very, very highly demanding. And uh, I do not believe that a, a simple change by either changing the prime minister or changing a few constitutional um, aspects in relation to the, the demands that the protesters are asking for would change their spirit. So uh, I think they're looking for a fundamental change, a change that calls for a change in the entire political system itself, uh, and one that actually encourages and influences and gets them involved themselves. So uh, I think the king is in trouble, personally. And what we've seen currently um, in uh, Yemen, uh, Syria, uh, and of course not to mention Egypt and Tunisia, and, and very much so, we must also remember um, that uh, Libya, who's not too far away, a lot of the tribes in Libya have their roots going all the way back to Morocco. So uh, 
I think personally that this will be a step up in the, the numbers of demonstrations and people will keep on asking. And I, I think not unless there's a radical change would the protesters quell their demand for change, which is the rightful one, I'd say. Okay, now, uh, Mr. Alum, how significant is the presence of the youth, Morocco, uh, like the other countries in the region that are experiencing um, revolutions or uprisings uh, right now, has a very large young population. How significant is that in this situation? What Mr. Johnson just said, that basically he did not think that just a few changes would be enough. Being that the majority uh, of the uh, population is young, what do you think? Do you think that they can be calmed down, per se, with a few changes, or will they require extreme changes in Morocco? I think major changes need to need are needed to be uh, developed and needed to be activated inside Morocco and different Arab states that we are witnessing today, uh, you know, uprising and riots or opposition against the regimes in the Arab world. You know, what we need to look forward is planning, fighting corruption, giving the opportunities for the youth of our youth, you know, the educated, I believe so, like my colleague has mentioned today on air right now with you. I believe the, call, the young people in Morocco and in Tunisia and in Egypt, those well-educated people, they need to be given enough programs for them to advance in life, give them opportunities to build their own families, their own house. You know, their, independent, their independence here is very important financially. Now, we are not digging deep inside the, the root problems, you know, that we are facing in the Arab world as youth. And I'm, I am one of, the, of those young people facing corruption even at my own country in Lebanon, whether it's at the ministry level, at the department level, at any level that we can face corruption, we, need, we ought to face it, whether we are Christians, Muslims, or even Jews in the Arab world. We need to look forward in order for us to develop our skills, improve our talents, you know, and face all the problems that we can. But at the first point, this is very important, I think, we need to have excellent and feasible administration that we are looking forward to have. They should be transparent, fighting corruption, and people who are well-educated, but could be, maybe, this is very important, could be independent, and at the same distance within all parties inside that they are involved politically in the government. Of any government, I'm saying. We need to have the freedom of expression, the freedom of our points of views, Freedom of press, this is very important, whether we are in Lebanon or any Arab nation around in the Arab world today. Now, Mr. Johnson, what is it exactly about these uh, regimes or the leaders of these regimes that uh, it takes their people actually going to the streets to make significant changes. Um, the king promised the changes when he started. He knew the situation. He knew the lack of job opportunities. He knew about corruption. And yet very little was done. Uh, why do you think that that is the case? Well, I think it's uh, complacency, um, uh, taking people for granted, um, thinking that the normal, usual status quo would apply, where people would usually just vent their frustrations at home within their small communities, and that would be as far as the protests would go. But uh, I think they miscalculated, and it would appear that now there is a, a revolution cutting across Africa, across the Middle East, for change. And one thing about these revolutions is that it's very infectious and very catchy. People use 24-hour television networks like the ones that we're dealing now on press TV and watch and understand the issues. And they, they feel, well, hang on a second, if it can happen over there, why not over here? So uh, uh, I think when you start thinking about how draconian some of these uh, administrative administrations have been, especially that with Morocco, where state-controlled media, state-controlled operators, uh, very much so um, anti-terrorism laws are being used to c c curb human rights uh, movements. Uh, I think uh, um, people have a right to vent their frustration. So uh, it's backfired terribly on these administrations that think that, one, the job is for life, or uh, two, that they would always be there and they could do whatever they like, how they like, and uh, people are saying no more. So. Uh, I think uh, they miscalculated in terms of the timing, but uh, it would appear now that uh, communities, countries, individuals are saying we've got to stand up. And even if a few have to die, like we've seen sadly, uh, so many have lost their lives um, for asking for freedoms that people take for granted around the world, um, so be it. And the people are asking for change. Change will happen, come what may.
Okay. Now, Mr. Saloum, as, uh, as I'm talking to you, I'm looking at uh, footage uh, from Morocco, latest footage uh, coming in today. And notice the flags that was written uh, in Arabic, La ilaha illallah, there is no God um, but Allah. How significant a role do you think that Islam is playing in uh, on these uprisings, uh, specifically right now looking in, at Morocco, but in general? Well, uh, the, the notion towards Islam by the Muslims in the Arab world has been seen as a savior, savior because they, they believe that their own kings and their own leaders have not been saviors to their own societies. They have been maybe a bit tyrant. They have been in, in, uh, unjustful with them, you know, unfair. And so th what they are looking for, maybe they are running away from their own societies and looking ahead through the Quran and Islamic culture to improve their status and look for solutions that they can, they can build upon with the help of uh, you know Muslims that they have been, that, that they are uh, leading the way on the sirat al mustaqim you know and leading the way on the truthful honest and anti corruption you know measures that Islam has ordered us to move ahead on they believe maybe the Islam is uh, Islamic uh, values and traditions and maybe culture is the new constitution to them and can be seen as a savior to a lot of people that they are following the true Islamic values in the Arab world today. And now, Mr. Johnson, your perspective on what Mr. Saloum just said in an international perspective, how do you think that the uh, Western powers, especially the former colonial powers, uh, are looking at this whole uprising and revolutions in the workings in the Middle East? Are they afraid of what they're seeing, or, or how do you see it? Well, of, of, I think there's total panic around the world, um, especially when there seems to be a massive change happening. And when, when change happens, it means that it, it impacts on your influence, it impacts on uh, the likelihood of how resource applications are made, especially that of foreign direct investment. Um, and uh, a lot of the Western governments around the world have had influences in some of these countries, especially Egypt, um, Tunisia, and very much so that of Morocco. And uh, if the status quo changes, especially if governments change and the, the method of apparatus have, have changed, then they would likely to be affected. So uh, there's panic and there's huge concern, no doubt about that. And uh, there's this discord now between the Western influences and the East having a, a far more influence on some of these countries. And going back to what my colleague was just talking about, going back to the fundamentals of, of religion, um, uh, the, the, the tribal atmosphere within how people have e evolved and governed over time, that is going to play a far more important role than any influence that would have happened in the short term, especially over the last 50 years. Now, Mr. Saloum, do you think the Arab world has changed forever with what is happening in 2011? Uh, do you think that it will ever go back to the way it was? And what direction do you think that the Arab world in general is going to? Well, it is very important to the Arab world and to us as youth and leaders, you know, the, and, the, and the free Arab world, let's say, today. Uh, we need to invest in our own strengths and do not let our enemies, such as Israel and even the West, to invest in our weaknesses in order for us not to develop ourselves again. You know, the, the, the weakness still, uh, I can see it inside the Arab world today, could be a hindrance or could be a barrier of us as Arabs, and especially the youth in the Arab world, not to advance in the, in the, in the near future. So I can see myself in the midst of a new, uh, maybe Arabia or a new uh, independent Arab states, I hope, but I hope there should be, should, there shall be collective thinking, wise decisions to be made, you know, and uh, enough measures in order for, uh, for all the youth in Arab world to, to be given equal opportunities and to develop their skills and talents and lead the way for newest generations coming up in the future. Okay, and on that note, I'd like to thank uh, you, Mr. Mohaj Salam, uh, political analyst uh, from Beirut, and uh, Mr. Ayo Johnson, broadcaster and specialist on African affairs from London. Thank you both for that uh, look at Morocco. And thank you, viewers, as always, for staying tuned to Press TV. Don't go away. The news is next in less than four minutes. Thanks so much for staying tuned. He's seen hard times. He's walked along strange and mysterious paths. And he's on a never-ending mission. In search of something. In search of someone.
for the thousands of survivors of a brutal and unfair war, John Henry is a sight for sore eyes, eyes begging him to tell the truth. <laughs>